Hey, good afternoon, everyone. The voice past the Q. Thank all you guys for joining me again for Tuesday night Bible study. I appreciate all you guys on this path that's uh, rocking with me and allowing me to uh, give and share with you what God has given to me. So thank you guys for tuning in this Tuesday. I want to give you some time to get settled in and um, join me in Bible study. I thank you guys for continuing to do your social distancing and the quarantine and all things that's taking place. Thank you guys for all the shares, the likes, and the support that you've been showing me uh, mentally, spiritually, financially. I thank all you guys for praying for me. Um, I just definitely appreciate all you guys that God has given me. So um, didn't know a lot of you guys from day one and uh, starting a ministry, but I thank God that he has given me you guys. And when I say that, um, I have earned your trust to be able to uh, give you the word of God. And that's definitely an honor to be able to... Uh, feed so many people the word of God. So I just want to thank you guys for your participation. Thank God for your ears and thank God for all you guys do to help me to uh, be the man of God that I'm trying to be. And I thank everyone for their encouragement too. That definitely goes a long way. Definitely means a lot. So I want to thank all you guys for support. A lot of you guys reach out and tell me that um, the job that um, God is doing it through me is blessing you guys. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who do that. I definitely appreciate that. Definitely means a lot. For the support okay now that i got that out the way tonight we're going to be talking about the world's hatred and um you know i just was on my timeline i seen something else about more po police brutality i know that's going to be another hard one for us to digest and deal with but we just want to just talk about some things i brought up in uh sunday service about you know jesus told us in the scripture we're going to go there turn to john chapter 15 while you're at it uh jesus told us that uh the world will hate us but just because the world hate us that we're not to respond with hate but uh he told us that the world would hate us but as i say we're not to respond with hate i pray that through this message you would uh get a certain type of level of maturity to understand how to deal with the hate and understand that um the hate is not particularly against you the things that you go through hopefully after you hear this message you'll understand how to deal with people people in your family people in your job um, you know, uh, whatever it may be, baby, mother, baby, father, husband, wife, uh, friends, cousins, you are you're going to understand this, uh, about you, about your assignment, about the attacks. Uh, they're not just happening just because of you, you know, so, uh, get blessed by this message. Turn with me to the book of John chapter 15, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we're going to go into some teaching. We'll give you some scripture tonight. If you have your pens available, please take some notes so you can go back and read this. Don't just um, listen to it tonight. Go back and read it because you may need it to go back over it once I give you the scriptures. I wrote the scriptures down, so I encourage you also to write them down too. Um, uh, bless all you guys on here. Write these scriptures down because you're going to need them. Hope not go back and play them if you're driving. Um, I understand. Let, let's 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 go into a, a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you right now for the boldness. We thank you, Father God, for all those who uh, have come to join us tonight for Bible study, praying for them, their family members, their friends, their kids, all things concerning, Father. We just ask, Lord, for understanding. We ask that the Holy Spirit will give us wisdom, knowledge. You said in all you're getting, get understanding. Allow us to be able to understand the scriptures. Make the scriptures come alive to us. Make the words jump off the page, oh, Father God. Make us understand it and be known even as we are known, oh, Father God. Uh, Lord, allow us to be able to receive this milk and Lord, allow us to be able to digest it that we may be ready for meat and we may be ready for solid food. Thank you, Father, and all these things we pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So listen, let me get some light up here. There we go. Praise God. So look, um, John chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus states this. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Right here and there, Jesus just puts it out on the table. He says, if the world hates you, the world meaning people, you know, he teaches us to be ye in the world, but not of the world. But he's saying that if the world hates you, you know that they hated me first. He's like, yeah, don't just be like, woe is me because people are not going to like you because you got to understand because people dislike me. And if he be inside of you, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So if Jesus is inside of me and the world hates hated Jesus, that means that the world is going to hate me. The thing mistake we make as Christians is trying to be liked. Jesus did not call you to try to be liked. He called you to love, to be loved. There's a difference. He didn't call you to fit in either. He didn't tell you to try to get people to like you. He told you to love people, even though they don't like you. And I want to teach you that. I know you say that's hard to do, but there's a purpose behind loving your enemies. There's a purpose behind the reason why you're hated. If you have Jesus, 
one of the confirmations I was trying to explain in Bible study, one of the confirmations that you have Christ is the hate that you receive from the world. Now, I'm not talking about just people hating on you because you have nice stuff. That's a different type of hate, but that's a blessing. That's part of it too. But if people are just disliking you, he said, blessed are those who, he said, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed are those who are blessed. He told us to bless those who despitefully use you. So when people are coming up against you and you having these attacks with your cousins, with your friends, I, I talk to a lot of people on a daily basis. They're having attacks from family members. It come from family too. It come from friends. It come from coworkers. It comes from the people that's close to you. But when Jesus said it, he said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So if I have Christ, I'm supposed to be hated. I'm not supposed to be like because I have Christ. And Christ, and I'm going to teach you, Christ is definitely offensive, causing people to be defensive making people uncomfortable. If I have Christ, people are not supposed to like you. Notice this. We know we, we can feel they don't like us and then we try to be like, but then when we try to be like, that's when we compromise. That's when we find ourselves in error because in order to be liked as a pastor as well, that means you have to water the word of God down. People love a pastor who water the word, the water, waters the word of God down, not preaching the unadulterated word of truth. People time, sometimes dislike a pastor that preaches the word of God. And they say, you stepping on my toes. But if I'm stepping on your toes, that's a good thing because the Bible says that God chastises those whom he love. If you're reading the word of God and there's no chastisement, that may represent that you're none of his because God is not a God who's going to leave you in error. He's going to chastise you. And at times he uses the world to chastise you, your supervisor, you know, things like that. And the dislike of people does not mean for you to dislike them back, but it's supposed to create in you a level of maturity and your maturity is to be able to make you perfect in love. How do I become perfect in love? By God allowing me to be under attack, but then while being under attack, love the very person who's attacking me. I know that sounds crazy, but, but, but God says, I use the foolish things of this world to be able to confound the wise. I will call somebody to attack you, then ask of you to love the very person that's attacking you, call somebody to hurt you, then ask you to to forgive the very person that's hurting you. And you say, why, why, why is that? God says, because I'm going to perfect in you the perfect love. Now, now, if I can get you to understand this concept, you'll understand that concept. You have offended God more than you have offended anyone. That's when he was telling the disciples, how many times should we forgive? And he said, 70 times 70, meaning that he didn't want them to keep track of the number. He says, I just want you to keep on forgiving because I want you to do unto others as you want done to you. I want you to forgive people the same way I forgive you because I forgive you for every offense, even the offenses you don't think I know about. I'm constantly forgiving you. So what I'm trying to get you to do is be more like me. And if I'm going to be more like Christ, be more like God, that means I have to be a forgiver. Now, God is always forgiving now, but he always teaches you and I too to be, harm, to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. He says, forgive. He didn't say be stupid. He says, forgive. He didn't say be stupid. He says, forgive not to be stupid, but he's teaching me to be more like him. In order to be more like him, I have to love the people that hate me. That's going to produce in me a maturity. But the very people that hate me, God sends them or allow them to be able to come. Let me say allow to help me to develop in areas that need to be perfected. Notice this, the demonic forces only come to attack you in areas that need to be developed, things that you have suppressed, things that you're dealing with from your childhood. The demonic force always comes to attack you in a place where you need to be developed. You show me a person who's offended, I'll show you a person who needs to be developed. You show me a person who's having an issue on their job with a certain particular person dealing with something, I'll show you a person that has an issue that needs to be perfected, an issue that needs to be corrected. So, Pastor Q, are you telling me that God allows me to be attacked so I can fix an issue that I have? Absolutely. The Bible said that Job said that the thing that he feared most has come upon him. So, God allow him to be attacked so he could correct fear. 
How could he correct fear? By facing fear. How can I deal with anger and unforgiveness? Well, by having somebody to maybe to push those buttons. How can I forgive? And how, God, I want to grow in love. God, I want to be more like you. Well, don't you pray that because the moment you want to be more like me, that means you want to have more people hate you because that means you want to forgive more people. If you really want to be more like me, that means you're going to be more forgiving. That means you're going to be more loving. That means you're going to always be the bigger person. That means that you're always going to take the high road. That means that you're going to take the road less traveled. Do you really want to be like me? Because in order to be like me, you got to be hated. In order to be like me, you're going to have to forgive even though you hate it. To be like me, it, it, it takes a lot to be like me, but I've called you to be my disciple and I've called you to love your enemy. I've called you to love your neighbor in this calling, you are designed, I'm creating you to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm creating you and forming you to be in the image of my son. My son was a forgiver, even at the point of death, he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even at the point of death, even hanging on the cross, hanging on the tree, how you want to look at it, he was still acting and forgiveness at a time where he should have been upset at a time where he shouldn't have been unforgiven. He should have been unforgiven. He was on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was still forgiving. A lot of us are having a hard time forgive us. And he was being on the cross with people that hated him, people that put him there. He was still forgiven because he know he knew that. Guess what? Not only here is great teaching. Why did he say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Because he had an audience too. You have to understand, Jesus had an audience. He had one on his left, one on his right. He couldn't say, sometimes we have to watch how as Christians, people of God, how we talk about not forgiving people because there are babes in Christ or younger people who listen to us and they take that in. So Jesus wanted them to hear them say he forgave them. Though the pain was still there, he wanted them to be able to say, I forgive you because forgiving them means that I have now become greater than the situation and have accepted what has happened so I can outwardly say I forgive you because once I forgive, now I will allow God to be able to work on me. But that's a totally different process. But I want you to know Jesus said it loud enough so they can hear it, that they were forgiven. Let's stay in John chapter 15 because I have a lot of things to cover. 15 verse 19, if the world hates you and you know that it hated me before it hated you, they hated him first. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You must understand, I see this all the time. You can be friends. You can have somebody that has an issue with you, right? And they don't have an issue with nobody else. They just have that particular issue with you. And they hate you because you're not like everybody else. Sometimes you're hated because you're different. Sometimes you're hated because you don't want to fit in. And, and Jesus says this. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. Sometimes you have to understand in Christ, I have to understand in ministry that if I was like all the other pastors, then I would be embraced. If you were like everybody else, then you would be embraced. Sometimes you're not embraced because you are different. You're not supposed to be embraced. And sometimes you're trying to fit into doors and, and ask God to get you into places that you're not supposed to be in because you're different and he doesn't allow it because he says you're not like everybody else. And sometimes that's why you get the rejection, but there's going to come a day when the door is going to open for you. But he says, if you were of the world, the world will love its own yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. The world hates you because God has chosen you. You can't do nothing about it. There's nothing you can do to be like unless you're going to compromise. People are going to dislike you because you were chosen. The enemy, the devil, the spirits, the unclean spirits, the demons, the demonic forces, they all know that God has chose you. One thing about it, people always like to, people get mad when you're chosen. Why she choose you? Why he choose you? How did you get chose? Notice there's people upset because you got chose. And sometimes you didn't even do anything to get chosen. People sometimes say people dislike you because you were chose, but not even understand the things that you go through. And sometimes when you're chosen, it doesn't mean that you have the better life because some of us on this platform know that I go through more because I'm chosen and I didn't even ask to be chosen. And my attack and everything is greater because somebody chose me. Hey, I didn't go. I didn't ask to be chosen. I didn't go out and ask everybody to have their eyes on me. I didn't ask to be chosen. Sometimes when you're chosen, 
Um, it's, it's just because of who you are. You're chosen to be disliked. Jesus says, listen, if I can get you, here's great teaching. If, if I've chosen you and the enemy knows that I've chosen you, it's going to push you to your destiny because this life is going to have you to be rejected and, re and rejection is redirection. He says, the reason why I had you to be disliked and to be hated so you wouldn't fit in a word and be able to get complacent. So the, all the dislikes made you uncomfortable and it actually caused you to either form your own clique or go do your own thing. You got to understand, I didn't cause you to be loved because causing you to be loved would have caused you to be stagnant. I couldn't cause the gospel to be loved because then the disciples wouldn't have been pushed out. So I caused them to be hated. God says to be rejected is a great thing because when people accept you, it makes you lackadaisical and it, and it keeps you in places where you're not supposed to be. Notice this. We don't get up and move or start unfriending people or start doing something different until we find out something around and somebody says something, somebody's talking about me. It takes me to find out something that caused me to be able to move. It caused me to find out that I've being hated on to cause me to be able to leave, to want to want to leave, to want to leave this job, want to get out of this clique, not to want to be around certain people anymore. Not uh, um, it, it that that hate causes me to want to cleanse, causes me to want to do a shift. It was all because of hate. It's all because somebody made me feel some type of way. Who knew that God knew that I was easily offended, and it only took one little funny thing for you to do something, little comment that you made, something you said. Yeah, I heard what you said. It just made me feel some type of way. And God has a way of allowing the hate to be able to show, to be able to push you out because a lot of us are easily offended. He says this because I have more scriptures. He says this, remember the word that I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep your word. You're no different from Christ. People look to crucify you People just dislike you, not because of your looks, but because of the Christ that you have inside of you. But it's designed that way. Can I, I want you to understand tonight. I'm hated so that I may be perfected. I'm hated so that I may grow. I'm hated um, so that because God wants to move me at times. I'm hated because he wants me to be able to develop. And how I'm developed in Christianity is God making people hard to love. Through my walk in Christ, one of the challenges that you and I have is loving people. Loving people is going to be the hardest thing to be able to do in Christ because God places the hardest and the most difficult people to love in the path of the believer. That's how he develops you. He gives you a great big heart too, but then he calls that great big heart to be broken. But then he places some of the worst people in your life. And then notice this, he hurts you, but then he gives you something to be able to wake up the next morning and say, you know what? I felt that I'm going to go in here. I'm going to deal with them, but I'm going to deal with you accordingly. That's why he says to be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. What does that mean? Wise as a serpent. The serpent is wise. The serpent knows how to get you. He knows how to be able to strike you. He's in striking distance, but he's harmless as a dove. How can I be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove the same way? You, you got to understand. I let my enemy know. Yeah, I'm in a position where I can hurt you, but I don't, but I'm going to be wise as that serpent. But I'm going to be harmless as a dove. The Bible says that the enemy, that the serpent in the book of Genesis chapter 3 was um, the most cunning beast of his kind. Jesus says in the word, I want you to be wise like the serpent. His skill set, how cunning he is. But I want you to be harmless as a dove. Use the wisdom of the serpent. But I want you to have the characteristics and the approach of the dove. Notice the dove is a representation of the Holy Spirit. He said, I want you to be smooth like a snake, but I want you to have the Holy Spirit. How can I be, how can I sliver like the snake, but then still have the power of the, I mean, the attitude of a dove of the Holy Spirit. But you you got to understand how to be able to mix the two. It's such a balance. Who knew that I'm supposed to be able to have the thought process of the snake on my movement? Because you got to understand the snake knows how to go down and how, how to get to his prey. He thinks, he outthinks his prey, right? He knows how to camel. He knows how to move himself. But then he says to be harmless as a dove. Don't go around squeezing people, uh, biting people. That's not what I've called you to be. But I want you to use the mind frame of the serpent, right? Listen what he says too. But all he said, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Most people who hate you do not know God. 
and the thing about what you have is very offensive to them. And since they don't know God, they're going to hate you. If they knew God, then they would embrace you. But since they don't know God, um, they're going to hate you. Notice as I was talking at the beginning of, on this platform, um, a lot of times on this platform, God will send us people who know him and them people will be strangers. A lot of you guys were strangers to me and I didn't know you guys at first, but he sent me people who would see the Christ that was in me. Now, he's not going to send me people who do not know him because a lot of times he draws the people who he wants to be a part of this ministry, who he wants to be a part of his calling. So this is what he says. He says, if I had not come out and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. I have a lot of people tell me through this wall, Pastor Q, I love God, but I don't get down with Jesus. I love God, but I don't believe in Jesus. And Jesus says this very carefully. He says in the scripture, he says, uh, he who hates me hates my father also. If you have seen me, you have seen the father. Jesus and God is not a separate entity, but notice you and I meet people who say, I, I love believing God, but I just don't believe in Jesus. But the, the one in there, they're the one and two of the same. You can't separate the two. There are religions that try to separate the two, but um, you can't do that. Jesus, Jesus teaches right here. He who hates me hates my father also, because if you have seen me, you have seen the father. There's no way you can dislike Christ, but then say that you embrace God when God sent the Christ. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, it's a powerful revelation. A lot of people don't get it, but I hope that you will. He says, if I not, if I had not done among them the works, which one, which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Jesus says, if I had not done the works that I have did, then they would not have no sin. But since they seen me do the works and the works testify that of my identity, um, not only do they hate me, but they hate my father also because they say they know him. But how do they know him if they have seen my works? So therefore they hate me. And the Bible says they hated me without a cause. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. That's what I want to give you. Jump with me now to Matthew chapter five. I'm going to give you a few scriptures on this. Hope you understand. And then, you know, we'll uh, we'll tie a lot of this in. I'm going the wrong way. Turn to Matthew chapter five around the uh, let me see. I want to go to the 43rd verse. Hope you guys will follow me tonight. Listen to what he says. Matthew chapter five. He's talking about loving your enemies, right? He, has, he said, you have heard that it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was Old Testament. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. He said, that's what you used to hear, right? He says, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This is such a hard thing to be able to do. First of all, how do I love my enemies, right? Loving your enemy is not, first and foremost, is not a feeling or as being in love. I think when we hear love, we think of the warm and fuzzy feeling that somebody makes us feel. Love is not a feeling. You don't have to feel it. He says, love them. Loving them, Jesus, God, God can, you got to understand, love is a place of respect. You got to go to, uh, I believe it's in Corinthians, and it talks about the love chapter, what love is. I think we get mixed up when he says, how do I love my enemies? But love does not mean to feel good about them. Love is how I basically treat them. Do you know that I can, when he says love you, he's basically saying how I deal with them, how I treat them, regardless of how they treat me. I'm not supposed, it doesn't mean I'm going to feel good doing it. But I'm doing it because it's a commandment, first of all, and I'm called to be able to what? Show love. But understand, when we say people are showing love, a lot of times the love that's shown is basically fake love. He's saying what? Love your, he says, love your enemies. And he comes back and says, not don't just love your enemies. He said, but bless those who curse you. Bless them. Um, wish them the best. Um when you, when you when you bless them, wish them the best, speak, speak well about them. But he understand, oh listen. Um, I still want you to do this for your enemy, but there's a purpose behind this. Do good to those who hate you. That's another thing hard to do. How am I supposed to treat people good who hate me? I'm no doormat. No, he didn't say be, be a doormat. He's basically saying, here, I'm going to teach you something real quick. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, right? Here's the thing. Why does God want me to do that? Why does, why does he want me to treat people good that treat me bad? Well, if you was to go, go, I'll show you something. Do I want to leave out of here yet? 
Um, now, I don't want to leave. I'm, matter of fact, do I want to jump out of that yet? Let me finish this and I'll go out of that. So he says this. That you may, verse 45 of Matthew, for, of, of Matthew 5. That you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and, and on the good, and sends rain to the just as well as the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Jesus is teaching right here. He says, there is no reward for loving people that love you. So basically he's saying that you only treat people good who treat you good. He says, I'm asking for you first and foremost to be like me because I need you to be a representation of me, not a representation of you. If you understand why he's asking you to show love, it's because he wants you to represent him. Have you ever had to treat somebody good that you didn't like for somebody that you do like? And you say, you know what? I really don't mess with you like that, but because you cool with my peoples, that's the only reason why I'm going to kind of, you know, maybe feed you or help you out. But for real, I don't mess with you like that. So God is asking for the same thing. He said, listen, because the strength of me and for you to be perfect and so that I can deal with the individual. God says, I only can deal with the individual if you be nice. I can't deal with them if you be nasty because you're killing my conviction. If you're nasty to everybody that's nasty to you, then I can't convict. I only can convict when you're nice to people that's nasty to you. Then that causes, as, as I'm going to get into Romans chapter 12, when he talks about pulling a heap of coals of fire over their head. God says the, the purpose of loving those who hate you is to make them feel bad because it makes you feel bad. To have somebody talk bad to you, but to have you respond back nice to them makes them feel bad when they walk away from you. Have you ever been nasty to somebody, right? And then they responded back nice and it makes you feel bad when you walk off like, dang, I said all that. And they came back and still said, bless me. Then at that point in the car ride home or whenever you decided to go on your way, that was God convicting your heart. But if that person had responded back, with the same type of tongue lashing that you responded with, God could not get the glory and therefore there will be no conviction of spirit. But when I respond back Christ-like and take the L, I say take the L because it don't feel good to back down to nobody and let somebody be nasty to me and I'll be nice back. It's like when I go to McDonald's and I want two syrups, so I want more ketchup and somebody say something. I want to be like, it ain't my fault you work at McDonald's, but it's for me to say, you know what? Bless you. Um, man, I, I pray for whatever's going on with you. And then I can soften them up. Then when I, when I give a kind word, a kind word turns away wrath. The Bible talks about once I give my kind word, what that does, that is the thawing out of the heart. You know, when your mother or somebody said, listen, we're going to cook this tonight. I want you to take that meat out the freezer. I want you to set it out, put it, put it under the, put it in water because I'm cooking pork chops tonight. So therefore I want that thing to be able to thaw out. So therefore I don't have to wait because we understand people hot is like a ice box. As they say in the, in the script, I mean, and as they say in the, in the rap songs and the um, R and B songs, if the heart is like an ice box. So he says, God says the person you talk to has the heart of an ice box. If you give kind word and treat them back nice and give them scripture or be nice to them who are nasty to you that persecute you right then and there the thawing is going to start because now the heat the heat notice this the heat from him uh the fire the fire representation of judgment comes on the heart convicts convicts the conscious having your conscience seared as with a hot urn you know you have pan seared tuna salmon whatever that type having the conscience seared meaning that there's a type of heat that needs to be applied, right, to the person's heart. And then that makes that heart tender. When that heart becomes tender, now God says, I can start actually doing the work because it's a tender heart, not tenderoni, tender heart. How does God get the heart to be tender, get the heart tender? get the heart to a place where he can prep it, where he can get it in the oven to start to work on it. It starts with you, sous chef. You have to get the person's heart to be able to thaw out. Once their heart be able to thaw out for some plants, some water, God give it the increase. All you got to do is talk back nice. That's going to bring the heat. That heat goes over top of the heart, causes the heart to be able to thaw out. Now, not as the heart is thawing out. They've been nasty to me at work all week. Now, as their heart is thawing out, what I do next? The next thing I do is start praying for that person, still being nice for that person. All of these things are what they call meat tenderizers. I'm not a cook, but I just know stuff I see in the cabinet. I saw some in the cabinet of 
other day and said meat tenderizer. There's something supposed to make the meat tenderizer. And God began to show me, he says, listen, my word is a type of meat tenderizer that if you be continued to pray for people who despitefully use you, be nice to them, bless them. He says, what's happening is I'm dealing with the heart. And if you do that, then what's going to happen? I'm going to be able to win a soul. You're going to be able to win a soul, but you have to understand this thawing out process. But if you go back and forth with that person, God says, I can't win because I'm, you're supposed to be my guy, my woman that helps me to thaw out the heart of an individual. If you know you're calling and you know you're supposed to save souls and that, and this is what, right? This is true. Since the devil knows you're calling. And he knows you're supposed to save souls. And he knows that you have the words of eternal life in your mouth. He's going to have people come at you hard because the harder they come for you, he's looking for you to respond negative. So he has you attacked. So to respond back negative. So when you respond back negative, it keeps you backsliding, keeps that person right where they're at. But if he sends the attack and I respond the direct, the direct opposite Oh, I got a chance to win a soul, but you got to be in a place of Christ where you don't care about your image. You know, the Bible says that uh, he who comes after me must first deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. I must be able to say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to take an L for Christ. I don't know how many of you guys have taken an L for Christ, but I've taken some L for, L's for Christ, meaning that I bit my tongue sometimes. It was something I could have said. I've taken some L's for Christ. I've, 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 I've side-eyed something and, you know, grabbed my chin and be like, yeah, I can like this, Jonah. I've taken some L's for Christ. But I understand that the enemy sent that person, right? Let me tell you what. This is another great teaching, too. Notice this, that the man that had the unclean spirit was drawn to Jesus, not to none of the disciples. He was drawn to the power and authority of Jesus. And he said, Jesus, oh, son of most high, um, why have you come to torment us before our time? before our time, that was a demon going on Jesus. Notice how Jesus responded. He wasn't like, shut up, man, get away from me. I'm going to tell you, stop playing with me. He didn't do that. He was just like, um, unclean spirit, come out of him. He said, what is your name? He began to talk to the demon, not even talk to the person because what Jesus was trying to teach you and I is that when you're in the presence of a demon, make sure you're talking to the demon, not to the person. If you're talking to the person, the person is going to get offended. Don't offend the person. Talk to the demon because the demon is talking through the person. One of the most um, strategic things you'll learn to do as a Christian when you get on this level, and it's a level, to be able to talk to the demon inside of a person without offending the person. Take the licks, take the blows, take all that slick stuff that person's saying, and guess what? Because I'm going to tell you what's happening. The reason why at times... The demon bucks back because he fears being cast out. He fe He's trying to push you. He's amping you to come out of yourself because he's looking for a reason for the person he has captive to defend him. How does a person defend their demon? By getting you to bock back. If he gets you to bock back, then that person is going to start to defend their demons and they're going to fight with their demons. But if you be nice, it makes them vulnerable. And then now I can win. But this is such spiritual teaching. I hope you get this. And you must understand stuff like this before you can even do street ministry. Because if you do street ministry and you don't understand this concept, the demon is going to tear you up. They're going to cuss you out. They're going to, I'm going to tell you, well, I've done street ministry and people have all said all type of things to me. And I know the demon and it's not for me to cuss them off but say, bless you, brother. Okay, you don't want to hear what I got to say. Bless you, man. Praying for you, praying for your family. That's a hard thing to do. But the demon will immediately attack when he see you doing street ministry, see you trying to teach somebody the Bible, see you on your page. Listen. How many of you guys quote scriptures on your post pictures on uh, quote post scriptures on your page, and then you get to somebody in your inbox, which is a demon that comes and question the spirit that you post, question the video that you post. It's nothing but a demon. The demon inside of the person, um, the person really wants to get free, but the demon is a uh, he, he's very uh, the very 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 argumentative, right? Always want to argue the Bible, always want to come against you, say things to offend your face, uh, faith, but we're not supposed to be offended. But every time I'm quoting scriptures, always somebody that want to come around. But I have to understand the demon's assignment is to keep the person in bondage, right? So people may not accept Christ the day I'm talking to them, but it's for me just to continue to pray for them and treat them nice. So when they believe in another God or they don't believe in Jesus, that's fine. I still treat them with the love of Christ. The love of Christ doesn't mean that I like them 
and I feel good about them. It's just that I treat them the way that I would want to be treated. That's that's all love is, treating somebody the way I would want to be treated. It doesn't mean that I like doing what I'm doing because if anybody tells you that love is liking what you're doing, that means that Jesus liked going to the cross. He didn't like going to the cross. He loved to go to the cross. Love was a commandment. It's something he did because he was sent to do it. He didn't say, I can't wait to get to the cross. That's not, that's not what love is. He, he didn't like going to the cross. He loved going to the cross. He loved God enough to go to the cross because he found out going to the cross wasn't about him. It was about the people that had to be saved. So love is not liking something. Love is doing it for somebody else. So when I'm at McDonald's, which I love to be, and I, since I love God, I'm love, I love representing him. So that means I don't like the attitude I'm getting from the other side of the counter, but I love God enough not to respond with the attitude that I'm getting across the counter. I love God enough not to respond, though I don't like the situation. He tells me, Q, you're not supposed to like none of this stuff. You're supposed to love to do, you're, you're supposed to love setting the example for me. But love setting examples for me, I'm always going to put you in situations that you don't like around people that you don't like around coworkers you don't like. Everybody is always going to be people around you that you don't like. But I didn't cause you to like people. I caused you to love people. Causing loving people is staying in character, even though people are doing things that I don't like. That's tough to do. That's a level of maturity. You may not be there. You need to pray and ask God, help me to be able to love, help me to be able to have a um a heart of flesh, remove for me a heart of stone, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Lord, help me to be more like you. And if you prayed that prayer like I just pray, prayed. As soon as you get off this line and soon as you go to work tomorrow, there's going to be an attack because how God gets you to be more like him is to what? Send more attacks. You don't be sitting in your living room and all of a sudden you wake up just wanting to love people. Your attacks have taught you how to love people through the things that you go through. Believe it or not, I use the foolish things of this world to be able to confound the wise. Everything that I, my, my level of love is based off of my level of attacks. If I have so many attacks, is he's teaching me how to love, how to be able to deal with people. Notice this, when you get a peace that surpasses all understanding, you'll be able to be around people that you know don't like, you know the people that's talking about you, and, and you know how to move around people at work and act like you don't know the stuff that you know. Let me tell you what, why is a serpent harmless as a dove? is knowing that the people you are around talk about you, but you still acting like you don't know what's going on and still treating them nice. Not being a fool. I'm not treating you nice because I because I want to, because I like to slap you. I really don't like you at all, but I don't have to like you. I have to love you. It's how I treat you. It's okay to buy your enemy something from McDonald's. It's okay to pray for your enemy. It's okay to talk to your enemy nice. But he never in the scripture said you have to hang out with them. You have to do stuff with them. Skip through the tulips. Um, hang, go to happy. He didn't say that. He says it's it's how you. I want your character to be when you're around them and representing me. He never told you to do anything. He never commanded you to do anything extra but love. Love is what. Love is showing his personality, his characteristics. Love is being a tree. A uh, uh um the fruits of the spirit. What is the fruits of the spirit? You shall know a tree by its fruit. God says, if you're a representation, if you're a representation of me, then you have to be a good tree. You have to have love, peace, um, long suffering. Notice, notice the fruits of the spirit: love, peace, joy, long suffering. Look at it. Long suffering is one of the fruits of the spirits. Fruits of the spirit. Long suffering. Long suffering. Long suffering is. Ties into James chapter one, um, when he says, uh, count it all joy when you face diverse trials and tribulation, knowing that your trials of your faith produce perseverance. Lo the longer I suffer, the more patience I learn to have. I become patient with people because of my sufferings, my sufferings and my attacks have caused, have shown me how to be patient with people. I should have give I should have been given up on. Long suffering has taught me how to suffer 
long with people I should have been giving up on a long time ago. You still do if I was I don't know how you do that. If it was me, I could nah, I, I couldn't uh uh be taking your car, don't bring it back. Man, uh uh I'm telling you, I would have been can, 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 can I teach you sometime the love of God has you go limps past when you were supposed to been done. You know, you sometimes you got, you know, sometimes you love somebody and you be like, man, I should have been gave up on you. You ain't nothing. And it's, it's the love of God. God is putting the love in your heart. Why is God putting love in my heart for somebody I should have been done with? Because God is trying to reach the person I'm supposed to be done with. And sometimes he makes me look like the fool, right? Because he's exercising his goodness, but I look like the fool to reach an individual he he cares about. And he don't care that I look foolish trying to reach somebody. God, so you got to be in a level of God. Sometimes we tell people, you should have been done with him, should have been done with her. And we're all so wrong, but we don't understand. Sometimes God gives grace. He gives you the ability to be able to love a person past their faults and to be able to give. And you're going to look dumb to other people. Now, I'm not saying this is justification to be able to take people back. But if God has placed in your heart forgiveness and has given you long suffering and patience and endurance with somebody you should have been done with, can I teach you? That in that same aspect, God is trying to reach them, but use you. Listen, at the end of the day, if you were a fool on earth so God could get in contact with somebody's soul, you will receive a reward in heaven. Now, this is not an excuse to stay with your baby daddy or stay with your, your baby mother or stay in a marriage that things are not going right. But if you have been given the endurance and given the heart to stay and you don't feel or see nothing wrong, but everybody else sees something wrong because God has taught that the angels in heavens, the angels in heaven without an S, the, angel in, the angels in heaven say, God, why do you love man so much? What is it about them that you keep forgiving them knowing they do what they do? And he'd be like, angels, chill, shut up. I, I love them. And they'd be like, man, God, if I was you, why do you love them so much? The Bible says even the devil comes and, and he's an accused of the brethren. God, why you love you so much? Like, oh, you see what he be doing? You see what it be like? I mean, the Bible says he's accused of the brethren. He accused it before the Lord day and night. So I got angels in heaven. And I got the devil. When the sons of God came to God, the devil came with them. I got angels in heaven telling God he should have been gave up on me. I got the devil pointing out all my faults, telling God about my stuff. And then I got Jesus, my advocate, the devil, my, my advocate, who is my representation, who is my attorney, my counsel, who, who says that when all when the angels wonder why and the devil accuses we bring out the cross and we say this how valuable they are. The Bible teaches that the angels don't understand why God loves us the way he loves us. They're upset about that. And the devil was like, look at them. Look at what they do. I bet you if you move this and do that. And guess what God say? The same thing that happens on in heaven happens in earth. You got friends trying to talk you. Man, I'm going to tell you what. The love a mother has for her son and the father for his daughter is almost equivalent to the love that God has for. I don't, I don't, I don't care. You could tell a mother that her son, her son didn't shout out the whole block. She's going to represent and love him. So that's my baby. Um, I don't, I don't care what you do to that dog. You can kick him, not feed him. He can come when you come home. He going to be, we going to be waiting at the door to greet you there. Right. That's the type of love. God says, I have the angels in my ear. I have the devil in my ear. But I still love you in, in spite of what's being said. Can I teach you that sometimes you got to learn to love people outside of what's being said? I, I have to still love people in my church knowing that they come to church, knowing that they don't know that the people they talk bad about me too. I know them too, that this is a small world, that it's that you come to me in prayer, but I, I'm also aware of what you have said too, because you talk to people who talk to me, but, but I'm, I'm still forced. I'm still called to love you, mean to still pray for you. I don't have to invite you over my house, but I'm still called to pray for you and treat you with the love of Christ. 
though I know what you be saying, and though I've been told not to rock with you as a pastor and ministry, I've been told not to deal with certain peoples because of what they said got back to me, and I've still interceded on the behalf. I don't like the people. I would be wrong to say I like them. I love the people. People say, you love me, Pastor Q. I, I love you. I do with the love of Christ. Now, liking you is something different. I don't like you at all because of your. I don't like your spirit. I don't like that you talk. I don't, there's certain things about you don't, I don't like. But love you, oh, I love you with the love of Christ because I'm commanded. Well, that seems phony. No, you got to understand. Jesus didn't like me on the cross. I don't have to like you. I have to love you. Meaning that liking you, because if I didn't like you, if I had to like you, if, if, if my likes, my like for you depend on me feeding, you wouldn't get fed. I can feed you, but not like you. I can pray for you, but not like you. You got to understand you mix love with like, not, not God. If you understood the difference between the two, you could love more people. The problem is you don't like people, so you can't love. You got to be able to love people that you don't like, and then you'll win. And then guess what? You'll pull a heap of coals of fire over top of the head. Once you learn how to love people that you don't like, love people that don't like you. Hey, I'm not here to be like. I'm here to love. I'm not here to be loved. I'm here to love other people. So hold up, this don't make no sense. I'm not supposed to be like, but I'm supposed to love people that don't like me. Oh, now you get it. I'm not called to like people. I'm called to love people. I'm called to love people that don't like me. I'm not called to love people who love me. I'm called to love people who don't like me at all. I'm called to love people that I don't like. It, it all goes together, right? This is, this is how he's teaching you and I. He say this, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father in heaven. For he and, and, and he goes on to say, for he makes the sun to rise and go down the same. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do the same. Tax collectors love those who love them. You know, people say, man, um, I, I love those who love me. He has not called us to do that. He says, and if you Greet your brethren only. What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. I, I notice on the street that, that the Muslim brothers, um, when they come to each other, As-salamu alaykum, wake, wake alaykum salam, I welcome to Aki. That's how the Muslim brothers greet each other. But they don't greet Christian brothers like that. Christians, we don't greet Muslim brothers like we greet our church brothers. Um, Jehovah Witness, they don't, if you ain't Jehovah Witness, they don't, they don't greet you like they do Jehovah Witness, unless you're trying to hear about being Jehovah Witness. Um, it's like that. But Jesus says, regardless of what somebody's belief is, I want you to greet them like one of the brethren. Don't just, don't, if, if, you know what, I, I've been in the street sometime and I say Muslim, I would have, um, um, well, like Salam. They're like, are you Muslim? No, nah, that's, 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 that's your, that's your saying, right? For honoring God. I can say that too. It's not just a Muslim saying, um, uh, As-salamu alaykum, my brother. They're like, oh, you Muslim? I'm not Muslim. As-salamu alaykum. I, I can say that. That doesn't mean I'm Muslim. I'm, I'm greeting you the way you want to be greeting you. Bless me. Bless you, brother. Yeah, okay. We can all say it. that's all. That's, that's lingo. But just because I say As-salamu alaykum don't mean I'm Muslim. I'm greeting you the way you want to be greeting. And in order, brother, to say, what's up, Ak? Me, Aki. That's my brother. That's my Muslim brother. I'm not your Muslim brother. I'm, I'm your brother because... We 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 uh we uh both serve the same God though you call him something different. But I don't have to treat you and deal with you like you call him Allah. I, I deal with you as a son or, a, or I deal with you as a child of God. I don't deal with you because you what name you call him. I deal with you because he's commanded me to love you regardless. So as a Christian, I have to love Muslims. I have to love Buddhists. I love 5%. I treat them like I treat the people in church with, with love. But do I like what they do? Absolutely not. It's not for me to like. It's for me to love. I have nothing against Muslims. I have nothing. I Listen, I have nothing against them. I may not like what you do, but I love it. God loves the sinner, hates the sin. That's how it goes. He teaches that very carefully. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 10. Just, just go over three chapters. This, this is another thing that's going to bless you too. I hope I can get through this because I wrote down a lot of different things. But I want you to understand. Remember I was talking about not being light. Matthew chapter 30. No, Matthew 10, 34. Christ brings division, right? He says this. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Here is your very Jesus. Say that he didn't come to bring peace. Meaning that he didn't come so people could like him. He said, I ain't come to bring peace. The Antichrist is going to bring peace. He's going to try to bring everybody together. 
Jesus says, I am not a peacemaker. For some time, can I teach you? Sometime when you're trying to make peace, you're not operating according to God. God didn't tell you to make peace. He told you to have peace. Sometimes that disruption is supposed to be able to be there. But you try to make peace. God said, I didn't call you to make peace. I told you to have peace. Making peace is trying to fix the situation. Having peace is being okay with the situation. There's a difference. God showed me the other day, says Q, sometimes people are trying to make peace and they lose their peace. Be at peace by what is. Be it you, 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 you're not at peace right now by the coronavirus. You're not at peace about the world being shut down. So you're trying to make peace. God said, try to make peace. Be at peace. Whatever well, it is, I gotta have peace. I would give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Hey, I don't like what's going on. I don't like being in the house. I hate putting the mask on. I hate the glove, but I'm at peace with it. Do I like it? No. I like being in the house. No. Do I like not being to go to work? No. He didn't say like it. He said be at peace with it. Do I love it? Do I love the social distancing? Yes. Do I like it? No. Love it means I'm commanded to follow the law of the land. So I love it. Do I like it? No. But I'm at peace with it. I give you a peace that's a passive all understand. Okay. Six more weeks, eight more weeks, one more week, two more weeks. I'm at peace. Do I like it? No. Do I have peace about it? Yes. I'm okay with it because I have peace. Listen to what he says. Uh, for I have come. Listen to what he says. For I have come to set a man against his father. Jesus says, I've come to set a man against his father. What about the scripture that say, honor your mother and honor your father? Something is wrong here. Listen to what he says. I, for I have come, set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's one of my favorites. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. I, I know the Bible didn't just say that in verse 36, that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. I, I know the Bible didn't tell me that my enemy ain't across the street. He live in my very own house. He says, I will cause that your enemy to come from your own household. Can I teach you a great teaching that the closer you get to Christ, that the, your own enemies will come from your own house. Keep your enemies close, your friends closer. Can I teach you the closer I become in Christ? My enemy is not the dude across the street. It's the dude that's closer to me. It's the dude in my church, the dude that I work with, the person I call friend, God raises up the enemy. Oh, you mean to tell me that he deals with me in such a way that it causes my friend to be able to become my enemy. He says, I didn't come for you to be at peace of everybody. I came to make some people your enemy. Oh, you mean to tell me, God, that you're going to call me to a place that me and my mother don't get along, me and my father don't get along, that my that a daughter-in-law don't, daughter don't get along with her mother-in-law. Oh, you mean to tell me this is strategically done, that when, when, when we got married, all of a sudden her father don't like me, my mother don't like her. It's things that's going on in the family. Oh, oh, you mean to tell me that it wasn't supposed to be peace? Now we're trying to be peacemaker. I don't know why my mother don't like my girl. My father don't like my boyfriend. I don't know what's going on. There's just no peace in the family. He said, yeah, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing something. That ain't the devil. That's the devil. Every time we go, God said, it ain't the devil. <laughs> it ain't the devil. He said, that's me. I, I'm, I'm bringing division. The house divided can't stand. God says that that's the reason. But guess, let me, let me finish the rest. I don't want to give you too much of the meetup. He says this. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. God says, you have to be so in tune with me because the spirits jump on to people that's closest to you. And you have to love me enough to be able to disengage with the person you love. You don't get this is such great teaching. Only the mature in Christ could get such great teaching. You mean to tell me that God has called me and that caused me to ruffle the feathers of people in my very own household. Spirits jump. Now, all of a sudden, your mother's acting funny. Your father's acting funny. Your mother-in-law all of a sudden is acting funny. Oh, why? Why? Oh, it could it be so that I must now show love and be the bigger person? Guess what? When your mother-in-law do something, you tell your husband, I ain't going back over your mother's house. Oh, yeah. That's what it's all about. It's for her to treat me nasty so I can come back and be nice. So what God does, I have you to be offended everywhere you go so that you don't want to go back. 
Guess who wins? The devil wins. I'm going to distance myself. I ain't coming around no more because every time I just say I'm going to come around, people treat me. I hear the Lord talk, the Lord shade. I heard what your mother said, your sister said. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You can go to the cookout by yourself. Guess who wins? Oh, the devil wins. Guess how you win? You go right around his mother and you say, yes, ma'am. No, sir, to her father. No, her father don't like you. Sir, can I get you a beer? I ain't telling you to be a doormat, but Jesus said, when you belong to me, I need you to learn how to win the battle. You win the battle by being people I have caused to shift on you. That's how you win. I'm teaching you how to love. I'm teaching you how to win against the spirits because let me tell you something. You may not think your mother-in-law got a demon, but um, yeah, I have called you and caused you to love. And the love that I have called you in has the ability to raise up spirits inside of people that have laid dormant for years. Listen, she just didn't start disliking you. She has always disliked you. But the closer you got to her son, closer you got to his daughter, when fear set in that she was losing her son, fear set in, he was losing his daughter, Fear has the ability to awaken the sleeping demon in a person and cause them to act some type of way. Don't tell me that fear doesn't create a insecurity that wakes up a sleeping demon that causes a person that who used to act okay. Why now are you acting a certain way after my promotion, after I'm starting to grow? Why was you, hold up, you mean to tell me before I was successful and started to grow. That demon inside you did not arise until I made it uncomfortable. I made it uncomfortable through my prosperity, through my growth in God. I wish that you prosper even as your soul prosper. So it took for me to be elevated. Crab come out of the pot. Crab try to pull back down. It, it, it caused me to be elevated, to awaken that which has always been inside of you. And guess what? God is dealing with me by dealing with you, raising something up in you, showing, uh, uh, raising something up in you. This is this what God do, right? He makes my enemy uncomfortable, but he's actually trying to reach my enemy. But at the same time, He's trying to develop me. He's, he's doing a double whammy. He wants to reach my enemy, but develop me. I got to help him. How do I help God reach, his, reach my enemy, but work on me? I be the bigger person, right? And then by me being the bigger person, he's working on me, working on my patience, teaching me how to bite my tongue, be quick to listen, slow to sleep, speak. Don't be, uh, don't be quick to wrath. Don't be quick to be angry. Don't be angry easy. Be angry, but sin not. But while I'm practicing, while he's working on me in that compartment, those compartments, he's trying to reach my enemy. He's going to get delivered. I'm going to get perfected. Oh God, so you doing so so you got a double on top. You, you, you getting a two for one. God said, Yeah, I'm developing you. But at the same time, I'm trying to get them delivered. So it works both ways. If I can develop you, they can get delivered. Notice that when Christ in the Old Testament, I'm getting close to time. In the Old Testament, he said, I'm, no, I'm not Old Testament. Revelations, New Testament. He said, I'm dealing with the church. And he was talking about if he can deal with the church and get the church together, then he can get the people together. But first, he had to deal with his church. God says, the reason why a lot of people haven't been delivered is because the people haven't been delivered. See, God says the problem with the world is not the world. The problem is, let me stop my alarm. The problem is with the church. The church is the reason why people are not getting delivered because when, 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 when people come to the church because the church haven't fixed their own issues, they're running people off because they don't have big hearts to be able to love. Notice more people are church hurt. And guess what? The, the devil, you know, God draws people to the church. If I be lifted up, I draw all men unto me. But because the church don't have a God they love, the church end up offending someone. Because they, you know, they, they, we deal with the homosexuality, we deal with adultery, we deal with so many things, and then we offend that person and run them off. And God has sent them to us to be able to love, right? But we run them off and treat them some type of way because they don't come to church all the time. We have basically just what ran off the people that God has sent, right? Because what we're not developed as a church. God says, I will make you a fisherman of men. Didn't tell you to uh, 
clean the fish. He told you to catch the fish. And, and, and what and what that means is God says, allow them in, right? Then allow me to be able to deal with them. I didn't tell you to call out their sin. I told you to love them. You don't got to like them being gay. You don't like them how to be in adultery. You don't have to like their tattoos. You don't have to like their piercings. You don't have to like their past. I said for you to love them. Love them means treat them like they have no fault. And then when you do that, I can deal with them. But when you try to clean fish, God says you run people away that I sent to be able to see my love. My love is shown through you. God says I show love to people through my people, through my disciples. If you understand that, then you will understand why it's important for us as a church to love people, not like people, love them. Because loving them gives God the opportunity to work. Liking them, you can't like people, people. Stop trying to like people. Learn how to love people. Love is to be able to know all about them, but still treat them the same. If you like people, you're not going to win anybody to Christ that you like. You're only going to win people to Christ that you love. The problem is you're trying to like people, and in the process, you're trying to be like. If somebody in your church right now who you know don't like you, and you you don't like them either, and you make it your business not to talk to them. They go when you go, I don't say nothing. I don't talk to her. She don't talk to me. I don't say nothing to Slim. He don't say nothing to me. That's that's part of the enemy's plan. He he's 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 caused such a division. He don't speak to you. You know how many times I speak to people that don't speak back. I used to go in the barber shop. I know the few dudes they don't like. I say, "What up, man?" I go in. I dressed everybody. Listen, you don't speak back. You don't speak back. And sometimes I go to a place and I speak to a person who I know don't like me just to be able to free myself. That's like me giving somebody a compliment that has something I want. I do that to free myself. That's nice. I like that. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's real nice. Because I free myself because I don't want to uh, have any type of hate, any type of covetousness or any type of jealousy. So I free myself by speaking to the person who I know is not going to speak back to me to free me and put the press back on them. Because once I did my part, it's like forgiveness. Hey, all I got, man, listen, I forgive you. It's on you after that. I I'm going to free myself. I'm not going to be walking around mad at you because that gives you the opportunity to be mad at me. And then we both not getting blessed. And I need to get blessed. So therefore, listen, I forgive you. You don't like me. That's cool. Listen, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to speak to you. Uh, Claire, I know you don't like me. Dave, I know you don't like me. That's cool. But every time I come in, I'm going to speak to you because I got to get out of that because I don't want to walk in the room and, and have your demon make me feel uncomfortable. And the next thing you say going to pop off. So how I free myself is letting that go because someone is thinking like, I'm still not speaking. I'm not speaking to her. Well, you're going to stay in bondage to that. And guess what? Because that's your issue, you're going to go to the next stage, right? And you're going to meet another person like that. And if you notice, there's a lot of people you don't speak to. Uh, we all have that few people. It's not just one person you don't speak to, but everywhere you go, because you've adopted that habit from your mother's house to the cookhouse to your job, Everywhere you go, there's somebody you don't like like that and you don't speak to. And it becomes a pattern or a habit. Oh, I don't talk to her. Oh, I noticed you. We ran, you, don't, you ain't say nothing. Oh, we don't talk. Yeah, I mean, it's known. People in the family know we don't talk. Man, I want to be free. What's up? You know what I'm saying? I'm going by my way. You keep that energy over there. I want to be free because if I hold that, then I'm a slave to that. And then that thing uh, allows me not to have the proper flow and I'm holding that energy. The Bible says, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. So the longer I'm mad, it starts to set in. And now the thing that I was mad about, it's hurting me more than it's hurting the person I'm actually holding again. I got to get free. I got to let that go. Man, you know what? I forgive you. It is what it is. If you don't forgive me, that's fine. I got to let that go because I want to grow. And since I want to grow, I got to let that go. You can be mad. Guess what? You can forgive and the person can still be mad. And it's not your job to get them from stop to stop being mad. It's your job to say, hey, I forgive you. It's not a, If you don't forgive me, that's fine. I have to get this off of me because the longer I carry this thing, it creates a weight that's blocking blessings. So therefore, I'm just going to let this thing go. Man, you can go home mad at me and you can feel some type of way. But where I'm going, my development and, and, and the relationship that I have with my God has caused me 
to call me to let this type of stuff go, man, because I don't want to keep walking around feeling funny coming over your house and knowing you don't like me and then we walking past each other not speaking. Man, I can't deal with that, man. I got to be moving in love. And then here's a great teacher as well. Why you two are not speaking to each other, you that are the mature one in Christ, you have given an enemy the cage to say, you know them two don't like each other. Look at them over there. Um, but uh-huh, what church they go to? Now, now you're killing my witness because now everybody to cook out know that I really want to slap fire from you and they watching us. And I'm trying to invite somebody to church. But then the person I'm trying to invite in church, once I leave, they're going to say, yeah, oh, she invited you to church? Yeah, but you know, um, she don't even be speaking to her mother. Oh, for real. That's what people love, right? People love that I invited you to church, but I don't got a good relationship with my mother, good relationship with my father, me and my sister ain't speaking. People love to bring up, but you know he don't got a good relationship with his kids. <laughs> you heard about how he treated his wife? <laughs> yeah. See, and then, then that's that, right? But it's not for me to try to clean up everything. I'm just saying if you can clean up some of these areas in your life, then the enemy don't have anything because people are looking for a reason not to accept your witness. So they say, oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, but he don't even take care of his kids. He don't, um, yeah, he ain't, um, he ain't all that. Yeah, he ain't, he only talk to his mother. No, this is the whole time he's been here. He don't say nothing to his mother. He don't say nothing to his father. Damn, that's for real? Oh, wow. Yeah, he asked me to come to church. No, I ain't going. I ain't messing with it. Yeah, for real. I wouldn't go either. Yeah, I mean, how you going to teach me about the Bible? And, and here it is. It could be a solid person, man. You could be solid, right? And it's just that you and your mother and just the people just don't get along. Or you, or, or you just don't mess with one of your sister friends or one of your brother friends. You just don't mess with them. But the whole time, something so small and innocent can be killing your witness. Let me go through this. I want to get through this real quick, right? He says this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me, he is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life will find it for my sake. So there's, that's Jesus giving the scriptures. Blessed are those who persecuted for my name's sake. I just want to make sure I give you all the scriptures. I think I have one more. I want to give you my favorite. I'm going to give you this one, and then, then, then you'll understand. Go to Psalm 23. This is one of my favorites. I think I'm almost done. I think I've covered everything. I think I've given you enough meat tonight for you to be able to uh, digest all of this and be able to understand great teaching of why we must love. Psalm 23, for you are with me. No, the other I walk in the valley shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Um, No. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Listen, favorite verse of all, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why? Why? Why is that? Why does God prepare the table in the presence of my enemies? Okay. Notice this. So I'm a type of person. I want to do stuff in secret, but God always makes sure that my secret things be found out about. When I say secret, I'm not saying being sneaky. A lot of us, when we have nice things, you know how people respond to your nice things, right? And sometimes when you have nice things, you don't bring them around certain people because that's like, you know, sometimes you don't, you, you dress down or you don't want people to feel a certain type of way. So you don't wear your good stuff or you don't drive your good car. Some of y'all in that place where you don't bring out certain stuff. I can't bring this bag out because they see this, they're going to be mad. Well, well, you know what God says? God says to me a lot of times, Q, I'm not telling you to be flashy. I'm telling you to show I, listen, let me say this properly. I've prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. God says, I blessed you in front of your enemies for a purpose. And I never knew this. God, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. This is him. You bless me to be hated on. But then you want me to respond back to the hate. And guess what he say? God. Baby, I tell God all the time, there's always people hating on me. And he'd be like, um, yeah, I know, but you, but you got to love them. And he comes back to me and he tells me a scripture. He says, Q, to whom much is given, much is required. I said, what does that mean, God? He says, blessings come with hate. Do you want to be blessed? I said, yeah. He said, you want to be hated? I said, no. He said, you don't want to be blessed. And I said, okay, okay I get it now. He said, do you want to be blessed? I said, yes. Do you want people to hate you? And I say, no. He said, well, you don't want to be blessed because I'm going to bless you so that people hate you. But I bless you so that they hate you so that you can love them back. And that's how I win. Oh, OK, I get it now. So. Bless me to be hated. 
so that I may show love. God says, that is the bait that I use. Can you get it? Can I give you great revelation that you're blessed? See, this is such great teaching. I don't want to take you to, I want to take you out of kindergarten that you're blessed to be hated, to issue or return hate, to return, to return love back to the person that hates you. He says, listen, vengeance is mine. Say if the Lord, I will repay. He says, do not repay evil with evil, but to return evil with good. And in doing so, you shall pour a heap of cold, you should be a heap of cold fire over top of their heads. God, you bless me in front of people so that they could despitefully use me. You, you, you bless Joseph in front of his brothers so that his brothers could sell him into slavery. God, you bless me in front of people so that they could do me wrong. Yeah. So I can do what? Show them love. Oh, so this, what you do, you draw people to me to hurt me. No, 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 no. You miss it. Because every time I bring my new stuff out, they talk about me. So I don't even want to show people my new stuff. God said, you, you're losing. I didn't call you to be flashy, but advertise and show what I'm blessing you with because I'm dealing with your enemy. Because your enemy, the hate that he's going to have for you is going to cause me to be able to deal with him. How? By you responding back accordingly. I'm not ready for that. God says, don't worry. You ain't ready to be blessed. Don't ask me for nothing else. God says, we got a deal. God, I'm talking to somebody. Do we have a deal? Don't ask me for nothing if you complain about everything. Who am I talking to tonight? God says, don't ask me for another thing if you're complaining about the people at work, complaining about them, talk about you, complaining about them, disliking you, complaining about God said, don't ask me for nothing. God, why, why am I waiting so long? Because you complain about every blessing you have. Don't ask me for nothing. Because to whom much is given, much is required. If you can't take the hate that comes along with the blessing, God says, don't ask me for nothing. When I got married and when I got my, ever since I got married, ever since I got my car, ever since I got my promotion, ever since we went to Miami, we got back, Tasha been acting funny. Keith been acting funny ever since. Oh, so... I blessed you in the presence of your enemy. Guess what? Act funny right along with him. It's required. I bless you. It's required for you to treat people back with love that I allow. I made the people mad at you. God says, I make them mad at you so that you can show love. And guess what people say? That's what God say. That's why I can't tell you what I'm doing, because if I tell you what I'm doing, you'll say, you know what? I don't even want it. If, if, if God showed you the type of hate, persecution, attacks that's going to come along with what you're asking for, I tell you on everything. You're going to say, God, I don't even want it. So guess what he does? He develops you first to get to a place of peace, a place of acceptance. So when he does bless you. You know how to handle it. Because the thing about it is, you got to learn. Listen, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. At the table. Can I teach you something real quick? How much time I got? I'm going to do this. So look. Judas wasn't smart enough to be drawn to Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Luke. I think it's chapter 6, 12 through 16, that Jesus chose Judas because Judas wouldn't have been smart enough to choose Jesus to betray him. So Jesus showed me something because I asked God one day, I said, God, why did you choose Judas? How did you manage to, you knew he was going to betray you and you still chose him. He says, I did it because I had nothing to attract him to me. So I had to choose him. I say, God, give me great teaching. Give me great, give me powerful revelation. He says, Q, I had nothing for Judas to be jealous of. So I had to choose him. But if he really knew who I was, he would have chose me. If I had nice things, he would have chose me. He said, I had to choose him. I chose him knowing that once he got to know me, he was going to betray me. 
because he wouldn't have known me. And unless I kept him close, he couldn't betray me from the outside. So he says, I actually chose the person who was going to take me, who was going to set me up to go to the cross. I chose him. God says, you ain't smart like me. So this is what God says I do, since you ain't smart like me. Because nobody goes out there and say, yeah, I'm going to choose him to deceive me tomorrow. Man, you're going to be my friend because you're going to set me up. Because guess what God showed me when the dude, that was my man, set me up. He said, Q, if you knew he was going to set you up, would you hustle with him again? I say, absolutely not. He says, what if you knew the day you became friends with him in the sandbox that he was going to set you up? And the setup that he was going to set you up was going to set you up to be able to be with me, to be Pastor Q. Would you allow him to set you up again? I said, absolutely. He said, you get it. But if you knew he was going to set you up, you wouldn't have dealt with him. But if I had, but if you understand, I introduce you to him so that he could hurt you to introduce you to me, to make you who you are right now. You would appreciate him. He said, you still want to kill him? I said, nope, I don't. He said, so if you see him in the street, you don't want to do nothing to him? I say, I don't want to go that far. God. I don't want to hang out with the guy that set me up and brought me to the feds, but I don't want to kill him no more. He said, see, what I did is allow you to choose your friends and, and you choose the people who are going to harm you. I said, God, give me great teaching. He said, okay, Q, you want great teaching. He says, Samson chose all the women that were supposed to hurt him but I gave him the desire for those women. Oh, so God, you know I like that light skin. You know I like that thing. You know the type that I like. Yes, God says I created you to like the finest of the finest son. I created you to like him like that daughter. Guess why I created you that way? Because I created you to be attracted to the thing that's going to break you, that brings you to me. Oh, so God, this is how you work. You have me attracted to something that's going to deceive me like a Judas and bring you to me. God say, yeah, because only way I can get you unless I work through something that you like. So I created you to like things that are going to hurt you. Wow. God, so that's how you work. So you mean to tell me on the other end of sexy and fine is the thing that's going to hurt me that brings me to your knees. God said, boy, you learning now. So guess what people say? Uh-uh, I ain't messing with you. I know your type. <laughs> I ain't, uh-uh. I don't want no more tall, no more light skin, no more in shape, no more personal trainers, no more double Ds. Man, just give me something regular. And God said, guess what? I have somebody unattractive do the same thing to you that the attractive person do. Because when you try to settle to be safe, I'm going to have somebody who wasn't on your level hurt you. Guess what? Anything you choose, I've created you to choose. Man, look at God. God's so powerful. God says, because I created you, I created you with your desire. And your desire is going to always put you in front of somebody who's going to break that little heart that sends you right to me. God says, you can't outthink me because I created you to like the bad boy, the bad girl, the girl that don't, the fast tail girl. Girl, the hood do. If it ain't rough, it ain't right. God says, I created you that way. Guess what? He gonna break that little heart. She gonna tear the little heart up. Guess what? That's all my creation. I do that. I created you. Go back in the book of Judges and tell me that God didn't create Samson to like Philistine women because he knew that that Philistine woman was gonna play Samson right where it need to be. So God says, when I created you for ministry, I also created and allowed demons to attack you that was going to grow you up in ministry. God says there's not a demon or unclean spirit that walk of the planet that I have not allowed to be assigned to your development. God, why does everybody dislike me? God says everybody has an assignment to develop you. God says I use demons and devils to develop my people, not Christian people and not good things. Why do bad things happen to good people? God says, I use demons and devils. Listen, Job said what? God used the devil to develop Job. He says, Satan, have you considered my Job, my faithful certain jo servant Job, that there are none like him? God put the devil on Job. It ain't taught that way, but I bet if you go back and read it that way, you'll find it. Sometimes we put somebody on him. Girl, I got somebody for you. And we put... A guy with a girl, or we put one of our friends with someone. I got somebody for you. Mm -hmm. 
You got money, my girl. Sometimes girls know you got money, and they got a girl that they know can get it out of you. I'm going to put you with my friend. She know her friend can get the money from you. She know, I know my man can get it from you because I'm going to put you with somebody. And that's why you always have man, put me with one of your friends. They say, I got somebody for you. And, and that's what the devil, <laughs> it's so funny because that's what the devil and God does. God said, boy, I got some devil. I got somebody for you. He's like, who you got? I got Q for you. And, and he put the devil on me like he did with Job. And he said, I got somebody for you. The devil said, God, he, God go to the devil. He said, listen, who you got? He said, I got one that's bad. Boy, I got someone that's going to, man, I got somebody. I got somebody for her. God go to the devil. He said, what you got? He said, boy, I got Kevin. He drive a Lexus in shape, got money, got everything. Send him. God said, let me get him. Let me get him from you. And the devil said, sure, you can get him. Send him past Keisha house. Right there. Send him by the beauty salon. Let them meet. Oh, yeah. God says, mm, guess what? The devil, all the whole time, God working through Mr. Nice, right? Look how God do borrowing demons from the devil to get our attention. God say, yeah, let that walk past him. Yeah, he going to like that. He going to beep the horn to death. Man, I've met this fine junk today. Where you was at? Man, I don't know what she was doing where I was at because don't normally girls don't normally look like that around this side. But man, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that too, for real. Yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. Yeah. She gave me the number, everything. We posed a hookup. I, I, and she got what she said. She was lost. She don't even normally be around here. She was over at cousin house. Oh, perfectly set up. God says, I'm getting ready to get my son. I'm getting ready to get my son. And they, and how are you getting your son? I allow my son to meet something that's going to bring him to his knees. Thank you, devil, for allowing me to rent and to borrow. Did I give you great teaching tonight? Do you understand? Prepare a table before you in the presence of my enemies. Do you understand the system? I, I, I hope and pray that, and I'm closing my Bible. I've been over too long. I hope and pray that the, that the word that I gave you tonight understand, gets you to understand the system of which we live in. The people that we deal with our demonics are, are, are filled with evil and unclean spirits. They're not to hurt you. They're to grow you up. Everything is a test. Everything is assignment. The man at work, the guy across the street, people at the store, friends of friends that don't like you. Everything is a test and assignment that you may be perfect and that you may mat be mature in all your works. I hope you received this message. Father, I thank you, Lord, for a great message, great teaching. I know that they received it. I thank you, Lord, for teaching me even as it was taught. Thank you for so many great people. Oh, Father, God bless this broadcast. Oh, broadcast. I don't want it to be shared for my popularity, but I want it to be shared for the healings and the deliverance and the understanding of others. Thank you, oh, Father God, for everyone that watched the broadcast and those who are going to watch you later in Jesus' name. I love you guys.